we're ready to get into the Word. <laughs> Keep your hearts open, saints. Just because you think praise and worship is finished, it might not be. Alright, let's come out time to God. Father, Lord, we thank you that you are at work in the earth today, Lord. To take out for yourself a people to be the bride of Jesus Christ. And Father, the invitation you're extending to all mankind to bow their lives, to surrender all. My God, we pray that our hearts will be found loyal to you. So we invite you, my God, to do amongst us, with us, and through us all you will. Lord, help me to teach, but above all, my God, help us all to hear. Yes. At this day, my Lord, my God, that you would deposit Amen. an understanding so deep in our spirits. My God, that the fruit there will be a yielded, surrendered, separate life, full of joy and worship in the Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Right, today we're going to be looking at the penultimate, or the second last feast of Israel. It is the sixth feast. It's called the Day of Atonement. And you can turn your Bibles to the Hebrew Scriptures, or the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 23, reading from verse 26. Now as we saw, as we began looking at the autumn feasts last week, that all the autumn feasts have to do with the return of Jesus Christ and what He will accomplish at His return. These spring feasts all dealt with His first coming, His death, His resurrection, the salvation He brought, the work of the cross which so few Christians in the church fully understand. And we see the depth of the work of the cross. That it wasn't just to forgive us our sins, but to change us, to make us new creations, to take away the old man, and replace him with a new being in Christ. <coughs> Ended with the Feast of Weeks, which is the baptism, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And then last week we looked at the Feast of Trumpets, which speaks of the rapture and the judgments of God being, well, the judgment being poured out immediately that the rapture takes place. And we saw that very clearly through the teachings of Jesus. We always thank God that Jesus taught very clearly and accurately. It just takes man to confuse the teachings of God. And so we ended off last time in heaven. The church taken before the wrath of God is poured out and immediately the church is taken. And we see very clearly from the teachings of Jesus there's no second chance. So all these books on the um, left behind and son of left behind and daughter of left behind and the return of left behind aren't biblical, though they may be entertaining. And now we come to the Day of Atonement, which in the Jewish calendar is the most important feast. And we'll take up from verse 26, So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also, the tenth day of this seventh month. Remember, the Feast of Trumpets begins on the first day of the seventh month, and we saw that the number seven it's very important because the first feast takes place on the first day, seven days after the Lord of a thousand years. And as we enter into the, be the beginning of the millennium, the millennium begins with the rapture of the church, or I should say just before the millennium, the church is raptured. So this seventh month shall be the, the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted of soul on that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Now, saints, the Day of Atonement, like any of the other seven feasts, was a holy day. Any person found working on that day would be executed. Any person not observing that day would be executed. And as we know, as, well, as we come to know, that everyone in the Feast of Israel points to a work that Jesus Christ came to do to save man. And because He's Lord of the Sabbath, He alone had to buy and purchase our salvation. And the Bible, when the Bible talks about working on the Sabbath, it is a prophetic shadowing of any person trying to earn his or her salvation. If you try to work for your salvation, if you try to please God with good works, you will be cut off from life. You cannot please God by being a good person. You cannot please God by your own righteousness. 
Because our righteousness is a, as a filthy rag for the face of God. We have to depend solely, completely, totally, utterly on the work that Jesus accomplished on the cross. Amen. Our salvation is directly tied into everything Jesus did. And all you and I can do is respond in faith. There's nothing else. Now the Bible says in the day of atonement, then on that day you are to afflict your souls. And the way the Jews did that was by not eating for 24 hours. Which is a great affliction of soul. <laughs> and saints, there's a reality. Because if you're going to enter into the new covenant, it's going to cost you. Serving Jesus is an affliction. It's not a roller coaster ride into glory. It is a, an affliction. You enter by many obstacles. You enter by bearing many hardships. You enter because Satan is going to attack you. The world is going to be against you. God is going to be pruning you. And if you think serving Jesus Christ is a glory ride to heaven on your daddy's yacht because he's God, when you get sick and tired of not seeing your Christianity working, get back to the Word of God. And so the Jews had to afflict themselves by fasting, by not eating, while they repented of their sins on this most holy of all the feasts of Israel. As we turn to Leviticus chapter 16, we'll see that very specific instructions were given to Moses regarding how the feast was to be celebrated. And remember, as we read the Hebrew Scriptures, as we read the Old Testament, we are going to see how Jesus fulfilled to the minutest detail every single one of the ordinances. And how we, are going, how we, through what Christ has done, enjoy the benefits. Christ paid the price that we might receive the blessing of eternal life. And so in the book of Leviticus chapter 16, and for those of you, if this is your first time, it always starts off slow. It's the Old Testament. And then as we see the performance, it starts to get more and more exciting. So if you can make it through the next 10, 15 minutes, we'll start making great, glorious sense. In verse 2 of the 16th chapter of Leviticus, the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at simply any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering, and of a ram as a burnt offering. Now for those of you who, who know what the old tabernacle or temple looked like, you had the holy place, which was the place that the priests would come to on a daily basis, and there was the table of showbread where they would bake bread every morning and every evening and put it upon the altar. There was the menorah, the candle, the candle stand with the seven lights, which represent the seven spirits of God, which the, the oil was replenished on a daily basis. There was also the altar of incense. And the priest would go there on a daily basis and to offer these various sacrifices to make sure that these three tables or these candelabras were kept burning. And there's a whole type of shadow there, which we're not going to get into. Then there was a thick veil, a curtain. And behind the curtain was the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And upon the Ark was the mercy seat that was guarded over by two cherubim. And in the Ark was the Law of Moses, pot of manna, and the Aaron's staff that had budded. And the Shekinah glory of God hovered in the old temple, in the first temple, above the mercy seat. And... Any man that went into the holy place was immediately struck down dead. And so Aaron could only come into the holy of holies, the place where God dwelt in his glory once a year, but he had to come with specific offerings and sacrifices. If he didn't, if in any way he did not go through this ritual of cleansing and atonement and offerings, he immediately came to the holy of holies, he would die. And so God says to Moses, Aaron cannot come simply at any time into the Holy of Holies. Let's take up from verse 5. 
And he, that's being Aaron, shall take from the, children, the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering, and one ram as a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make a tone for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. So you will pick a short straw to see which goat will be the scapegoat, and which goat will be the goat for the sin offering. Verse 9, And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell, and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, to make atonement <coughs> upon it, and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. And shall kill the bull as the sin offering which is for himself, that he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side, and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood of his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring it, in, bring its blood inside the veil, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. He had to make atonement for the holy place. He had to cleanse out the holy place because of Israel's sin. And because of their transgressions, for all their sins, and so he shall do for the tabernacle of beating, which remains among them in the midst of the uncleanness. And finally, verse 20 to 22. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all the iniquities to an, in, to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. So you all understand what would happen on the day of atonement. That the high priest would take a bull, sacrifice the bull for himself, for his own sins and the sins of his family. Then he would take two goats, two kids, two lambs, and they would draw lots to see which goat would be used for the sin offering and which would be for the scapegoat. You want to know where the word scapegoat comes from? It comes from Leviticus chapter 16. The, the, the lamb or the goat for the sin offering, they would sacrifice and Aaron would take his blood with incense into the Holy of Holies and there seven times would an, anoint the mercy seat and God would forgive or atone for the sins of Israel. The scapegoat would then be brought before the high priest and after he had put his blood upon the altar, he would lay his hands on the scapegoat. And as he laid it, God would in the spirit transfer all the sins of Israel onto the goat. Did the goat at any time become a wicked demon possessed goat? Did the goat then become sick and hard to handle? No, he just, be he just became a representation of sin. He became a substitute for the sin of Israel, and then he would be led by somebody into the wilderness, left there to die. And that was the day of atonement, which Jesus Christ fulfilled for us. You see, saints, the Bible teaches in the book of Exodus many times that no man can see the face of God. Jesus in the Gospels repeated this. No man can see the face of God. From the day that he was to gaze upon God, he will die. And so Aaron had to go through all these elaborate um, sacrifices and ordinances just to come into the presence of God. Not see the face of God, but just see the Shekinah glory of God. And if he didn't do that, he would die. And so how does Jesus fulfill the Day of Atonement? Well, before you do that, I just want to clear up a misconception. And I've shared it before, but there's new people and some folk don't always get it first time. There's a teaching in the, in the church that Jesus Christ upon the cross became, he took upon himself all the sin of humanity. And so he became 
in God's eyes, a sinner. And as a result, he went to hell and was punished in the very deepest depths of hell for three days because of the sinfulness of humanity. Now that is a very Gentile type of interpretation. Nothing against the Gentiles. It's just not Jewish. Jesus never became sinful. He never became sick on the cross. Though he took our sickness, he never became afflicted with our sickness. He became the representation of sin and sickness. Just like the scapegoat didn't become a naughty goat. After Aaron laid his hands on him. He was the representation of sin. In theology they call it substitutionary sacrifice. One who takes upon himself the sin of another. So Jesus did not become a sinner on the cross. Had he done that, had he become sinful on the cross, his death would have been in vain because he would no longer be perfect. He had to in all ways be perfect. And so Christ became a sinner by taking upon himself the sin of humanity, then at his death he would have died a sinner. And his sacrifice would have been in vain. Do you understand that? Nowhere in the Bible does it teach that in the sacrifice of the Old Testament or in the work of the cross, that Jesus or the scapegoat became sinful. They became the representation of sin. They bore upon themselves the sin of the people. But it didn't make them sinful. They were the substitute. So we see that the high priest comes into the holy place once a year on the seventh month. And now we look at how Christ fulfills Day of Atonement, and what that means to you and I. So turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to read from verse 11. As you turn to the book of Hebrews, was written to the Jewish believers who had backslidden, had been persuaded to come under law again. And the writer of Hebrews is speaking about the Day of Atonement, how the high priest would come once a year into the Holy of Holies. And then he compares what the high priest did to what the true high priest, Jesus Christ, accomplished after Calvary. Remember, on the third day of his resurrection, Jesus celebrated the Feast of First Fruits. For those of you who are here, remember, as I am, so shall they be, follow after me. Verse 11. That Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. Saints, when Moses received the instruction from God to build the tabernacle, God gave him a, a very detailed uh, instruction on how to build the temple, its measurements, what it would be made out of. And Moses took this blueprint and he built it. But that blueprint was a type and a shadow of the heavenly temple where God dwells. And here the writer of Hebrews is saying that Jesus Christ has come as the high priest of the more perfect tabernacle, of the true tabernacle. Verse 12, And He comes before God not with the blood of goats and calves, referring to the Day of Atonement, but with His own blood He entered the most holy place once. Once and for all. In other words, Jesus went to the holy place only once before God with His blood, and He did it for all mankind, for every single person. Nobody was excluded. That is, everybody who ever lived, and everybody who ever would live. Once, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ, the God, the blood of the perfect God, forgives all mankind for all sin. Not some of mankind for some sin, but all of mankind, for all sin, no matter how depraved or wicked that sin is. Because such is the love of God, and the goodness of God, and the grace of God, and the mercy of God, and the desire of God to have people adopted by Him to be sons and daughters. It is the heart of God to be a loving Father, and He excludes nobody. So Jesus enters once and for all mankind into the most holy place. Having obtained eternal redemption. <laughs> Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats 
and the ashes of the hyper sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The writer of Hebrews is saying to the Jews who understood blood sacrifice, he's saying if the blood of goats and bulls that were offered on the Day of Atonement could cleanse your sins, if the blood of an animal could cleanse you in the sight of God, how much more the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Most High God, how much more can we be cleansed? In other words, the writer of Hebrews is saying there should be no doubt in any of our minds that the sacrifice of Jesus was complete to forgive everyone, every sin. Did you guys understand that? Everyone, every sin. If the blood of an animal could cleanse, how much more the blood of God? There should be in the mind of the Christian absolutely no doubt of the grace of God that is poured out abundantly through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. When you need a drop, God gives you a tidal wave. Right. Saints, do not let the devil lie to you and steal this great truth. In Jesus, we are completely, more than sufficiently, more than we'll ever need, forgiven. Completely washed. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you. Verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal... Uh, we did that. Verse 15. For this reason, He is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. He brought in, He ushered in a new covenant. A covenant far better than the old covenant. The old covenant required blood sacrifice. The sacrifice of animals. The old covenant required daily to sacrifice. Morning and evening. It contained laws. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. You've got to eat certain foods. It was all an outward thing. It was a work. But the new covenant is faith. But Christ enters into the Holy of Holies with His own blood. Just like the high priest had to take the blood of a bull for himself and the blood of a goat for the nation of Israel, for God to forgive Israel for that year, Jesus comes with His own blood and He lays His own blood before the altar. Well, how do you get to heaven? Is that really important? If you can explain to me how God makes a tree from a seed, then I'll explain to you how God makes That's right. But God can do anything, and He did something. And He put the blood of Christ, He took it, and He put it before His throne. And there it is, to this very day. So when you, come in, when you come to God, in the name of Jesus, God looks at you through the blood of His Son. And if the blood of a goat could forgive you, how much more when God gazes at you through the blood of Jesus, how much cleaner can you be? How much more forgiven? If a blood of a goat for cleanses, how much more the, God of, the blood of God? Amen. Now, saints, Jesus said, no man shall see the Father and live. And there are some Christians who erroneously believe, that is, incorrectly believe, that we will never see God. That you and I will never see God. When we go to heaven one day, there will be the throne of Jesus, but we'll never see the Father. Well, that's not exactly true. So if we go to the book of Revelation, chapter 7. And those of you who did the eschatology, it was nearly a year ago. Probably time we did it again. Who would like to have the eschatology done again? Alright. It can do something strange. How about on a Saturday night? Is it too strange? Alright. We'll teach it again as the Lord leads. We'll just pray about it and the eldership will discuss it and in consultation with the leaders and we'll see how the Lord leads on that. In the seventh chapter of Revelation, for those of you who have done eschatology, we see that the seventh chapter takes place after the 
The seals are open, which is the first and second parts of the 70th week of Daniel. And we are looking now at the church raptured before the throne of God. <coughs> Verse 9 says, After these things I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number of all nations. Praise the Lord. All nations. Wonderful. Did you imagine it was just Jewish people there? Not <laughs> <laughs> so bad? No, I'm just kidding. All right. After <laughs> saves all nations, God has come to save all people because God loves all people. There's no favoritism in the kingdom of God. After these things, I looked to behold a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the land, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Now they are standing, the Bible says. Where? Before the throne and before the land. Who's the land? Who's on the throne? God the Father, because that's how the book of Revelation opens. With the throne where God sits, the Father, and the Lamb coming into the throne room, which is Jesus Christ, and taking from the, Father, the angel's hand the scroll on which are seven seals. So this multitude of people are before the throne upon, who, upon which sits God the Father and before the Lamb. Because Jesus Christ entered into the Holy of Holies with His blood, because those of us who have surrendered our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and have become washed in the blood of the Lamb, have been adopted by God by being born again, the Spirit of the living God coming into our spirits, giving us life, we now have access to the throne of the Father. You see, before Christ came, no man or woman could be adopted by God. You could not be adopted by the blood of an animal. You could only be adopted by the blood of the Son of the living God. And so our position from the Old Covenant to New Covenant changes. We are, might be the people of God in the Old Covenant, but unsaved. Waiting for Messiah, which we saw happened when Jesus, on His ascension, took with them the saints that were in Abram's bosom. And they became adopted. You and I don't have to wait for this whole thing because Christ has already ascended. And at salvation, we immediately become adopted as sons and daughters of God. And God likes His children. And God wants His children in His presence. And you and I, through the blood of Jesus, will behold the Father face to face. We'll come into the presence of Him whom is undescribable. Whom this side of eternity we cannot even begin to describe or comprehend. His glory, His greatness, His infiniteness. Through the blood of Jesus, the Feast of Atonement allows us, once we are raptured, to come into the very throne room of God the Father and behold His glory. Isn't that awesome? And that is exactly what is going to happen at the rapture. We'll be taken by the Lord and put into the very presence of the Father. Because after all, God's Spirit is in you. He is the down payment of our adoption. And God wants to meet us face to face. Amen. Put another way, He wants you to meet Him. He already knows you. But you need to know Him. Now, in light of all that, comes this wonderful exhortation in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. Because Jesus Christ has made a way for you and I to come into the very presence of God the Father, through His blood, the rights of Hebrews then encourages the church. In verse 19 of the 10th chapter, the writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near Draw near to whom? The Father. Saints, 
I'm going to just tell you about an observation that I have noticed in the church in the years that I've been born again. Many Christians pray to Jesus. I hear the prayers of many Christians. And some of them are even in the ministry. And they pray to Jesus. Dear Jesus, would you in the name of Jesus do this Jesus and that Jesus? Because they have not learned that they can come before God. Jesus taught us, do not ask me anything. In that day you will ask me nothing. Speaking about His resurrection. Once I have risen from the dead, you will not ask me anything. Why? Because I want you to meet my Father. I want you to go to the giver of life. I want you to ask Him who loves you, who cares for you, who watches over you. In that day you will ask me nothing because you will ask the Father in my name. Saints, it's time that you and I drew close to the Father. And it's difficult because we all expect God the Father to be like our human fathers. And if you've had a bad relationship with your human father, you are going to battle to understand God the Father. And many of us need to fall down on our knees and say, Father, reveal yourself to me. Teach me to know you as Father. And forbid that I should relate to you as I would relate it to my earthly father. The church was encouraged nearly 2,000 years ago, and the encouragement still goes forth. Let us draw near. Because a way has been made for you to know the Father, to know the heart of God. Draw near. Stop standing on the outskirts. Stop standing on the outskirts too ashamed to come into the throne room of God, thinking you're unworthy. One of my favorite sayings is, deal with it. You are unworthy. I'm unworthy. There is an unworthy to come into the presence of the Father. So get over it. It's not about worthiness. It's about grace. And so we come before God because of grace that us draw near with a true heart. In full assurance of faith. Full assurance. Absolute conviction that you and I are welcome in the presence of God. Saints, the reason the church is so weak and powerless is because we have no faith. We do not draw near to God with a heart of assurance that I have every right to be in the presence of God, not because of myself, but because God wants me there. Amen. You got it? Amen. We can come before God because that's where God wants you to be. That's not an I thing, it's a He thing. He has made the way. And He who comes to God, as the writer of Hebrews tells us again, He says, it is impossible to please God without what? Faith, for he comes to God and must believe that he is, and a reward of them that diligently seek him. There's a way through Jesus Christ for you to come before the Father. Amen. And the writer of Hebrews says, because of Jesus, go for it. Amen. Because you're going to be spending eternity with the Father, and there will not be the first meeting. So saints, the day of atonement, through the blood of the Lamb, the high priest of God, your sins have been washed away through the blood of Jesus. You don't have to be a high priest. Because in light of that, and that's why I said, you know, I know a lot of you get offended when I keep talking about Jewishness, Jewishness, the Jewish gospel, understanding the, the word of God through a Jewish mindset. And you think, what's so special about the Jews? Well, truly nothing. There's nothing special about the Jews. There's something uniquely special about the Jewish understanding of the gospel. And that's why Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, Verse 9, the scripture you all quote, but now make it today will make more sense. The high priest was the only one allowed to go to the presence of God from the Old Testament. Do you all remember that? I hope you haven't forgotten it was about 25 minutes ago that we discussed that. <coughs> and only once a year, with certain sacrifices and offerings, but the Bible says in verse 9 of chapter 2 of the first book of Peter, or first Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you, that you are born again, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Let I say that again. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know this is the East Rand and things, you know, it's different time zone, we're going to slow here. You are a royal priesthood. Not you are going to become a royal priesthood. If Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, immediately you give your life to Jesus Christ and surrender your life to His Lordship. Lay down your life, take on his life, immediately you become a royal priesthood. In other words, 
You have every right to come into the presence of God like Aaron had. Except you don't take the blood of an animal. You come in the blood of Jesus. And you can come before God through the veil anytime, as often and as long as you want. Because you are a priesthood. Through Christ, you have become a priest. You belong like any priest before the throne of the Father. That is where in Christ you belong. In the throne of God. Worshipping Him. Beholding Him. Glorifying Him. Being strengthened by Him. Being changed by Him. That when you come out of that throne room, like Moses' face shone with the glory of God, you can go with the glory of God, the anointing of God, and be used of God to touch others. Because you are a royal priesthood, because of the day of atonement. A holy nation is unspecial people, which may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Amen. We can celebrate atonement today. You are priests. We are to worship God. It was the priests who brought glory to God. Saints, the reason we don't worship is we don't understand that we're priests. That we have every right to be in the throne of God. And ultimately, we are going to be for eternity in the presence of the Father. Have access anytime into the throne room of God. And the invitation is open to you today. Today you can come to the throne of the Father because He's expecting you through Christ. Not by your own righteousness. Not because you're a good person. There's no good people in heaven. Just sinners saved by grace. There's a lot of good people in hell. No good people in heaven. Okay? Goodness is not a qualification for salvation. Repentance. The desire to surrender all to Him. That's what gets us there. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's just bow here. Mm -hmm. Father Lord, we pray that your word, not the word of the man, but if anything I said, my God, which is incorrect of the flesh, I ask my God that it will be remembered no more. But your word, we ask, Lord, that you cut it into our spirits. Father, forgive us, Lord, for comparing you to an earthly man. To try and relate to you, to try to understand you through understanding of our fathers. Lord God, for even the best father on earth cannot even begin to compare to your awesome goodness. And Lord, help us to be changed in understanding. Lord, help us, my God, to meditate on what we've heard this day. That we might embrace you as Father, that we may come to you, my God, in the knowledge that you, through the blood of Jesus Christ, who has made the way, Lord, want us. In your presence. My Lord God, you want us to know you. Want us to be changed by your spirit. And Father, I pray for every person that is here today, my Lord, that has never truly surrendered all their life to you. My God, I ask in your grace and your love for them, Father. Lord, that you would draw them by your spirit unto the very foot of the cross. Where they may surrender all. And know the incredible joy being adopted as a son and daughter of the Most High God. We ask this in Jesus' name.